In the tail end of April, I was in contact with Bethesda's community manager and asked if I wanted to have a conversation with Doom Eternal director Hugo Martin, and me being the Doom Eternal fan that I am was ecstatic to take this opportunity. I was eager to talk to him about his projects before Doom Eternal, as well as how he approached going from creative director to game director, and how he feels that at one point he took Doom too far. Here's how that went. We're recording now, right? I uh, yes, yes. If that's all okay, right. Okay, cool. No, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time. I am incredibly nervous. I just want to get that on the table right now. Oh, um, so am I. It's okay. <laughs> but um, I, I've never had the opportunity to speak with someone so involved in the video game industry, let alone a director. This is a, a really hey, your, interesting predicament. Your content is awesome. You know, we're oh, fans. You've seen it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, oh, well, of course. Thank you. <laughs> that's... Yeah, yeah. Josh, Josh, and I love it. Marty loves it. You know, a hundred percent. You know, wow. we, we appreciate we appreciate the support. So it's this is uh, this is easy. Uh, so I've got some boring questions I wanted to ask. Probably all things you've been asked before. I tried to research beforehand to see if you've uh, answered sure, some sure. of these, but uh, you know, I can't check every interview you've done. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go in a bit of canonical order, and I wanted to ask um, about your work before. Uh, you worked on Doom before all of that when you were working as a concept artist. Yeah. Specifically uh, Pacific Rim. Hands down, my favorite kaiju film of all time, basically. <laughs> and uh, It's it, awesome. It, it's it a is good awesome. Movie. Um, and, like, that movie in itself is basically a love letter to basically all pop culture at the time. Well, that kind of nerdy pop culture. Which is kind of how Doom is. Yeah, exactly. Like, as soon as I found out that you were involved in Pacific Rim, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I, I wanted to ask specifically with uh, Striker Eureka, Eureka uh, the Jaeger yeah. that you helped design, uh, was there any pop culture at the time that you uh, specifically were influenced from with uh, designing that Jaeger? Um, I worked on all of them. The, the, uh... Oh, you worked on all of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, my absolutely. bad. I I thought they, that <laughs> they, was just the only one you did. Oh no no no! I, I, I yeah, I worked on I worked on all of them. There's a fair amount of Gundam in there for sure. Okay. I mean, ultimately, I think you're you're searching for what the director uh, responds to. It went in that direction because that's what Guillermo found interesting. It wasn't that he sat there and said, "Hey, you know, like make it look like this," or, or I, I mean, he molds it through iteration through reviewing your work. But certainly, you know, there's there's some Gundam in there. Uh, for sure. Being trained in, in automotive design, it is uh, entirely driven by the principles that I learned in autom in car design, you know, especially when I get a chance to design sci-fi stuff. That stuff is all over it, you know, just okay. kind of formulas and principles. So there's, uh, you know, the the, the, fra the face of it looks like an Aventador, you know, I mean, it looks like a Lamborghini when you think about it. So, yeah. and that's all I want to draw anyway. Retirement is just me drawing robots and Lam and, and exotic sports cars. That's cool what robots that's and all like. that. Nice. I did have a couple of questions for Doom 2016. One thing that I really liked about the game, and it's something that I never really noticed on like my first playthroughs, but as I kept, oops, I just tapped my microphone. Oops. Um, as I kept moving on, uh, I noticed it. Um, the usage of like green lights to direct the player on where to go were there any earlier attempts or more explicit attempts i guess to uh direct the player some way using visual uh cues and through the environment uh like was it trial and error or did you just know right away like oh yeah people people know what that means yeah green means go green That's means it. go like yeah <laughs> so so we just followed that principle of just guiding the player through the space okay uh using green lights and it proved to be the most effective and then it was just a matter of uh making sure that we tried to organize the visuals in such a way that like green wouldn't that kind of green wouldn't get used by anything else yeah so it was a conscious decision i i don't think that it's the kind of game where like some visual cues that other games might be able to use um, that are much more focused on realism, like scratches on the wall, like, you know, yeah. things like that would work in our game because you're moving so fast. Everything in Eternal and 2016 has to be big and bold. Otherwise, the player doesn't see it because they're, you know, they're, they're well, going by 200 miles an hour. Yeah, I mean, when you're in a race car, you can't exactly stop to look at the exit signs. That's it. So those signs need to be massive. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so, all right, now we're in the bulk of our questions. Basically, the rest of this is going to be about Eternal. Um, sure. With... Uh, uh, Doom 2016's demon design, a lot of the demons were like super grotesque looking, which is totally cool. Um, yeah, but yeah. then when you move into Eternal, a lot of the demons, like, it, not only is there like a more cosmic feel to everything, the, the design seemed to be a lot sleeker in some ways, a lot smoothed out compared to like, say, the Mancubus, for example. Was there a, a feeling of like having the art team just take the training wheels off and just say, go nuts with uh, demon designs? Or was it more carefully constructed going from that 2016 
design up to Eternal. Pretty carefully constructed, and okay. it was our chance to make the sequel different than 2016, but still true to the brand. And in, where 2016 keyed off of Doom 3, uh, Eternal uh, began to key off pretty heavily the original Doom. So I think if you compare screenshots from the blue health files to the way the mancubus looks to all the characters we definitely wherever possible and wherever it fit and helped our game uh we wanted to make it look like the original doom with the huge emphasis on uh gameplay it proved to be a, a functional choice because those things stand out in the environment super clearly and with the especially on the higher difficulties the intensity of the experience we really needed to make sure that everything was a big bold road road sign to the player and that proved to be the, that art was supporting gameplay in that instance and and also being true to the brand like we're really proud of the fact that eternal is like basically a modernization of the original doom yeah uh, yeah in a lot of ways I, I mean i'm sure you've gotten the comment a lot but like the minute i saw that classic cyber demon show up at the quick con or I, yeah uh, totally e3 it was like oh god they're they're embracing everything classic so as you could probably tell i'm from a younger generation i was i'm a late 90s kid um and i i, I love doom 2016 and i love doom eternal um but i wanted to ask was there a struggle to make sure that this game reaches a younger generation while still appealing to the older generation at all um i think that like not a conscious decision you know okay. certainly the original some people say oh they made it colorful because i mean the original doom is really colorful yeah like you know blue Especially hell file like, even like doom 64 like that yeah, game can totally. be dreary as fuck but there's still oh sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to swear it's your show <laughs> that's fair <laughs> but uh like even in doom 64 there's levels that are like there's a green sky basically so yeah, that's it's it. always been so colorful. like well and look at the original doom poster it's like a cartoon so yeah. that has been a guiding principle for us throughout this process there wasn't a conscious decision to try to appeal to younger consumers to be honest it okay. was just to like make a good doom game that's it like a game that was worthy of the the doom name and something that we thought was uh just really engaging more so hopefully in the long run than 2016 when it came to like you know subsequent playthroughs and things like that so yeah. we, we really tried to make sure that the the third act of the game had lots to offer the player and that even beyond that i think the more that you play eternal the more it gives you you know like the oh, better definitely. you get at it there's it's there's depth way beyond just completing it because there's just so much to master and once you do the better you get at it the more powerful you feel you know i could walk through our complex now and like i'm just like a god like nothing can touch me and that feels really awesome yeah so, i mean um, i've been i've been playing doom eternal basically non-stop since it came out and i'm still learning new stuff like yeah, uh, totally. it, it's crazy the amount of versatility well, and that's in there where super gorn has smash levels things oh, yeah. like that really help because they push you to a level that you're like yeah there's no way i'm doing this and then <laughs> when you can do it you're just like all right i'm god like yeah, somebody yeah like there, bring there's it on. a there's a point where you just hit that mode where you're just like you're totally engaged you're locked in maybe tunnel vision sets in and you're just like you're just going you're quick swapping totally. all over the place it's euphoric too and then when you go back to the old levels it's crazy you're just like this was hard once when um tag one came out like I, I spent like a week straight trying to beat it on ultra nightmare and then i go back to the base campaign and i'm like oh i know how to deal with all of this now yeah completely in your interview with Mayo, I, I saw that you had an Aperture Science shirt. Are you a are you a Valve fan? Yeah, as much as anybody. I wouldn't say that I'm okay. like the Valve fan. You know, I total absolute respect. Yeah. Um. And the the reason I wanted to ask that specifically is because uh, back when I first played 2016, a lot of the environments and stuff with the UAC, like with the the voice announcer and everything, I'm like, oh, kind of giving me a little bit of Portal vibes with Aperture Science. Uh, was that intentional? No. I, I mean, it was reserved, sort of restrained storytelling. You know. Okay. So like, I think anytime you do. This, that you're going to draw comparisons to a video game that kind of made uh, was revolutionary in, in that regard. I will take that comparison as as will all of us at ID. We take that with uh, with great pride. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's I a, mean that as a compliment. Highest, <laughs> absolutely. So and we take it as such. So in the the very first E3 teaser for Doom Eternal, you see the Doom Slayer. He steps on that skull. Um, his his armor looks a little different. How different was the design for the Doom Slayer's armor uh, throughout progression? Ar around what time did you settle on that final design? That final design is made by the the CG team. That was like a like a work in progress. Oh, okay. And then they did work on it specifically for the commercial. So it's actually a prototype of what this final armor was. It wasn't like a different design. It was just kind of like a prototype of what you saw now. It wasn't there yet, though. Like, it was okay. still a work in progress. And it was ended up being cobbled together from, like, different... It, when, when you're making marketing content at that time, you're still so early. 
So you're right, kind of using right. like prototypes and things. Uh, all right. Uh, so after, oops, I'm sorry. I keep smacking my microphone. After uh, Doom Eternal came out, people are freaking out about the Marauder, and then people find these like quick kill methods. Like I don't know if you saw the one where like you lob an ice grenade over the Marauder and he turns around, and then you pepper him with lock on burst. Like that's been patched out. Good in my opinion. Um, yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, how how did you approach that? Uh, was there a feeling of like should we leave that alone? Should we try to fix him, etc. Any strat that's like fair, like done, like I'll see strats with like grenades and people just timing the falters and basically like hit him, grenade, hit him, grenade, hit him again, auto shotgun, like you know those ones where they melt him in two seconds. Yeah, that is the whole point of that character. The entire okay. point of the Marauder is to teach you to combine your arsenal. That's it. He was meant to be the intro to basic quick swapping and or upgrading your abilities to be able to switch weapons faster. Like if you don't quick swap even just basic like ballista super shock and like tap R1 if you're on a controller, then at the very least it encourages you to upgrade your weapons so you could fire the super shotgun twice. We timed the falter window specifically to allow you to hit two super shotgun shots with an upgraded shotgun. That was the difference was like we didn't want it to work with an un with a uh, with a shotgun that wasn't upgraded and look, I'm maybe there's somebody who can do that but like generally speaking for most people you couldn't hit him with two shots with a base shot super shotgun you had to upgrade it so he was meant to encourage you to learn more about the game he's like the final belt test and once you beat him you know you're the king of doom and, okay. and once you can melt him then you're really a black belt most all the strats that i see of people combining their tools and doing all this crazy shit and just this dps combos i think that's totally fair game and that was that's what he was designed for okay. the ice bomb stuff is just an exploit i think when you find gotcha. somebody doing something that you're like that that's not really what we intend. You're not necessarily learning anything. You're just breaking him. You know, right. like okay. we we want everything in Doom to to teach you something, take you on that path to mastery, and that's not a good lesson to learn. That basically AI get distracted by ice bombs because that that actually doesn't work with any other AI. People mastering that doesn't really help them on the super gorgeous master level that's true because like um when the game first came out and i was like trying all these cool tricks like trying to see like oh can i crucible the the marauder and all that like i, I would just load up terrace nabod over and over like oh i screwed that up reload checkpoint and keep going yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. just kind of gush for a second. You made something really cool with the Marauder. I think he's one of my favorite demons in the game to fight. Like, he is. Could you imagine the game without him? No, I really can't. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I think it, it's such an old argument. I get it. Like, I, I respect the people who do it, but like trying to dig out... What, who don't like the Marauder? Yeah, that, that old argument of like the most controversial figure in Doom right. Eternal. I'm like, dude, ask any Doom fan who actually plays the game what they think of the Marauder. Like, is he was he perfectly implemented though? Like, no. Like there was definitely, you yeah. know, some some I mean, some issues there. I, I can imagine it being a bit confusing because that first room you fight him in, there's those uh, the gunner guys that can hit his shield. That was a terrible choice. We took them out. <laughs> oh, we you should took not them have out. done that. Okay, but we did. Interesting. That's part of what made him for some people frustrating because there was so much going on right. so we've since removed that and then we added the stars so that way because what we noticed yeah, the was stars. that yeah. people didn't know that he was stunned and he was also supposed to introduce you to like the nuance of the faltering system like when the character falters they can't yeah. respond and like what you could do with that in the cyber mancubus and that's all like nightmare strats that you know you really start to care about falters in nightmare The uh, he was supposed to teach you that but I think now that we put the stars over his head I think we're selling more appropriately like that he's stunned you know and you should yeah. shoot him I, I streamed my first playthrough of tag two as soon as people saw that stars show up over the marauder people were like oh i hate that oh that's so stupid and i'm thinking well now i know how long he's stunned for so like even though i like i play the game only on nightmare at this point like i go all over the place and i'm thinking like no this is great because i love getting people into the game and i know that that's going to be confusing yeah. so it, it gives you a way to more accurately tell what you're doing you can think better yep. with it and and it's a place where we could improve and we did and we learned mm -hmm. a lot so while i totally disagree that like the marauder at this point is controversial i mean i think people play the game and they love him but i do think that there was improvements to be made to his initial implementation and we've done sure. that like that's i mean the coolest thing about game development you know today is that we get the chance to like learn i mean like through streams through feedback through you know patches through data that we collect i mean it's just like oh yeah no like we get like on all games do it it's not just us like people that's why games get better over time, you right. know? So, um, yeah, it's, that was a chance for us to kind of like shore up some things and make sure that everybody understood what was happening and not just like 
certain players. Okay. Uh, did you collect data like that with uh, 2016 as well? Yeah, but 2016 is not as demanding. So, like, it's not there's there's not a lot in that game that you can't solve with a super double tap of a super shotgun. Oh yeah. You know, I I loved as soon as I unlocked that double super shotgun mastery. I'm like, oh, this is awesome, and then it breaks the game. It really does. It's awesome. It feels mm-hmm. amazing. But the more you play, the more you realize why do I do anything? Yeah, the, but the challenge is like, gone. There's somebody made a really good comment that I think perfectly summarizes it. The, the, when you play 2016 on harder difficulties, it actually steers you into the exploits. Like, the more you care okay. and your life is really at risk, the more you're like, I'm double tapping everything. Like, that's the get out of jail free card. That's the you need to die right now card. But in Eternal, the higher difficulties you play, whether it's Super Gornis Master Level, it pushes you into mastery of all of the systems. Like, a black belt of Eternal is basically someone who understands how to use everything. When you watch high-level players, they're icing, they're burning, they're burning in groups, they're destroying, you know, AI. But they're doing it by utilizing all of their kit, everything yeah. that the F-22 has armed, you know. Whereas, like, with 2016, it was more like, I got these two attacks that are really good. And when it matters, I'm going to fucking abuse these. So, we're, we're, it's cool to see it on Eternal. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of my favorite things that I've learned recently is like you get that ice bomb in there for that extra health drop. You get the you f- flame belt and then blood punch all of them. You, you oh, get dude. all of your stuff back. It's and that is so addicting. It, it is. never gets old. It is. It is the most. So you know a little story on that. That was based on uh, slot machines and like and really a basic principle of game design or just anything really, right? You know, my mom goes to. To, she likes to play the slot machines and the coins, and when she wins, what happens? And all the coins come flying yeah. out. And whenever <laughs> we totally talk about it, now. oh, we just kept saying, "Dude, it's got to be like Vegas. It's got to be like Vegas. Like you know, just like so." When you do it, when you, especially with the hammer, I love like icing, burning, hammering, and then blood punching, and you just. It, it's the game actually chugs a little bit too, yeah. which actually, in a weird way, adds to like the just the ecstasy because you're just like I'm breaking the game. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like there's like, all of this unused armor shards on the ground. I'm just gonna stand here, keep taking hits. It comes back into me. Do you uh, do you still find yourself like just playing the game for fun, like outside of development? Too much. Too much. <laughs> I have to stop. I just sent a text to one of the devs, and I'm mm-hmm. like, all like. I am so completely addicted to playing Taras Nabod's Master Level right now in Nightmare. Oh, like I am, I can't wait for that. Yeah, dude, and it's not the problem is I gotta, you know, I, I have to play other things, and I do play other things. I just, I, I just wrapped up playing Ghost of Tsushima, a really good game. The thing is, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, you know, I, I want to play, you know, I have to play test maps, but then I just find an excuse to like bang against Nightmare on on another Master Level. But it, the, I mean, I'm doing my job, but like I do, uh, I do play it uh, out of the pure joy of it all the time. I play on the streams just because I want people to see that, like, it, you know, throughout the entirety of development, we would all just play both on mouse and keyboard, but with base controllers, and we, and I beat it on Nightmare all the time. So, like, right. you know, I, I don't, I think it's extremely achievable on a base controller, like, on Nightmare on the hardest settings, okay. 100%. If I really, really want to dominate, you know, I'll start to You'll break mess out with the back the paddles, or you'll break out the, the mouse or, and keyboard. Yeah, or an SMVR, uh, one of the top PlayStation guys, you know, like, you just do bumper jumper, like, put jump on, like, reconfigure right. it. You know, I like to, I just, for the stream, I want to play it, you know, with a base controller, but I'm addicted yeah. to it. I mean, like, I mean, in a way, more people can relate to that too, uh, using a base absolutely. controller. I am so addicted to playing, like, that's why it's fun for me right now is because I found a new challenge and, and overcoming Taras Nabod master level with just a basic controller is just so much fun. Keep in mind, like a nightmare master level is our attempt at making content. If you're playing it, that master level on nightmare today. I mean, we are doing our damnedest to challenge the very best players, you know, in the community. So uh, yeah. that content is balanced. It's not balanced. It's pretty at times imbalanced, but that's what we're signing hey, up for. Like, <laughs> I don't I don't want to sound like I'm good at the game, but uh, I'm, I'm fucking loving it. Like, um, yeah, I, cool. I was it's addicted fun. to Super Gornest Master Level. Like, I spent like two days straight just trying to get that Ultra Nightmare victory on there. It, it's it's so fun. And that room, do you <laughs> do you do you still hear about that? That one room with like the two tyrants and the Doom Hunter in that yeah. tight room? Yeah. That, that's all I hear about whenever people talk about that area, and I'm like, I think it's fun. Well, it's just crazy, you, you know. It's it's uh, it gives you that oh shit moment, right? Yeah, that yeah, great yeah. games do, you know. Like I feel like all great games have those kind of moments, or a lot of them do. Of you course. know, where you're just like, oh my god, yeah. you know. And, and <laughs> you walk yeah. into a room, and then there's these massive titans, and you're like, okay, <laughs> that's it. Remember when the snake came out in Sekiro? I just remember being like, are you serious? Like, yeah. what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> you know, like you know, or or Mr. X in, in Resident Evil, right, or right. just something, you know, some some moment where you just like it's uh, it's great 
And and Super Gordon's Master Travel has a lot of those where you're just like, are you serious? Yeah. Are you serious right and now? This is what I'm dealing with. It's <laughs> what I signed up for, and I love it. Yes. If you would change any key moment from Doom Eternal, whether it be like level design or lore, uh, what, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Honestly, we changed it. We shouldn't have put <laughs> Tier 3 zombies in that room with the Marauder. Actually, no. We're cha- Okay, I'll give you a new one. Oh, boy. Uh, you can't ice bomb and burn the Doom Hunter boss fight. Like, that is horrible. Like, I hmm. cannot stand that you don't walk out of there learning that. So people walk out of that fight, and they learn that you can't ice bomb them. And could you just imagine today playing a Super Gorgeous Smash level and not ice bo- not ice bombing right. Doom Hunters? I mean, that, that's how you get rid of them. That, that's interesting you bring that up, because the first time I played, like, I, I tried to go in for that ice bomb, and I'm like, oh god, they're, they're immune. And, like, I didn't even know that you could ice bomb, like, the normal Doom Hunters until, like, my third playthrough. I know. That's horrific game design, okay. and that is my fault. <laughs> and that is being that is that is being taken out of the game. You're going to be able to ice them, ice bomb them uh, coming up in a patch, and it's totally balanced because honestly, by that time in the game, you don't really have like an upgraded ice bomb, and they right. barely get like you don't have the power to like really crush them. It's still like it teaches you something. So like, and I hate that you learn that lesson that you don't think you can ice bomb them. So okay. uh, that's another one I would say that we're fixing and i wish was in the big game to start um building off of that with the with the doom hunters did you ever feel like you should keep that sort of upgraded uh boss variant doom hunter as the the reoccurring enemies no, we just wanted that to be extra saucy gotcha what a is there a concept or idea that you personally contributed to the doom series that you take the most pride in like that you're the most proud of uh this is hokey i'm most proud of id like i don't take responsibility for that uh, okay. my myself by any means being a, a meaningful part of building that team has been i would say the greatest source of pride throughout all of this you know doom is like it's so easy for me to sit here and talk about it because making it was really fun playing it is really fun talking about it with you is really fun it paid off it's yeah and and you only get that if you have like a good team and the experience was good so, like, if it was drama, I, right. you know, like, how was it made? Oh, it was okay. It's good. <laughs> you know, like, fair enough. The, the, so, uh, I would say just uh, the idea that uh, we feel a sense of responsibility, you know, like, it's kind of like working at Disney, you know, like, there's the nine old men and the people who, you know, worked at Disney in the first generation. And then there's the generation from the 80s, like Glenn Keane and Andreas Dejas, and they carried the torch all the way up to the lot, you know, like, uh, shit, I mean, uh, right up until. The, hunch, the Hunchback of Notre Dame or when right. they started making their last animated films and then the 2D animated films and then there's the new generation and the, the John Lasseter's and all that stuff and and um, during our time at id we just want to make sure that we are uh, living up to the legacy of the people who came before us I don't think we're meeting their legacy I mean they changed video games but like we damn sure have to make sure that we're not ruining the, sure. <laughs> the sure. legacy of it so I think that's definitely been the most satisfying because honestly like you know people put their kids through college at it you know what i mean like it's just cool it's it's a it's a good feeling yeah and i mean hey like today um i i see you like meeting with all of these creators being super active in the community and everything and like that that's something that i I don't even see like a lot of indie studios being that active in the community and like what, what you're doing now is amazing yeah well honestly and we we thank you very much and and uh we love it I mean, it's an opportunity for us to give back to you guys. It's it's really crazy, the legs on this game. We, it, we are, yeah. this is a single player game mm-hmm. and we're a year plus from launch. The community is bigger than it's ever been. We have influencers, we've got banter, we've got a tiny bit of outrage, we've got it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, right. And uh, it's awesome. Especially uh, coming off of that time where, you know, people are saying like, oh, single player is dead. Yeah, like, completely. Now, like if I, I try to my best, like I'm probably going to be like maybe five or six hour long game if I'm actively like trying to go fast. And then it's still like one of the greatest games i've played in recent memory like i i play it almost every day at this point yeah and so like the community was so active it was just like what w- you know and people emerged like camp and toyota yeah, yeah. and mayo and you and you know all these guys you know like uh it was just like dude let's go out there let's give back to the community yeah. honestly and you know the best part like the side effect of that like i've met a couple of those guys and they're super nice and so like there's this bit of like bonding that you get with all of these people like 
oh, forming totally. a community together. It, it's awesome. Hemp is naturally extremely funny. Really? Like he is. I'll need to talk yeah, to him. He, I, I, I've like had back and forths with him on Twitter, but uh, I've never had yeah, a one-on-one just, on one he, conversation he's just with a, him. He's just a funny dude. They're, they're all they're all awesome. With work from home, we've had a lot of like patches, and we need to, hey, what's going on with the game? And oh my right. god, Blood Punch broke, and well, tell us how it's broke, and here it is, and here's the video, and like we've had to work so closely with the community that uh, we've just become, it's just built up a relationship. It's um, it's fun. Uh, all right, moving on to DLC and a, a couple questions about lore. Uh, now, I, I did write down some of these questions. I know, I don't remember what interview it was that you said it in, but you said like, you, you don't want to be that guy that has to go in and patch in all of these questions about lore, so I'll, I'll try my best to uh, not get too deep. Oh, no, well, I, we want to do the, the book. Like, we, well, I keep saying book. We want to do like some entries into the codex, maybe something we put up in the uh, Slayers Club, just to kind of like oh, do it I, justice. Oh, I do remember you mentioning that. I want to say in like, Tyler yeah. McVicker's interview. Yeah, we want to do it justice. That's okay. it. Because I'm, I'm starting to answer too many questions in interviews that are like, you know, we just got to save some things and then do you them You still really want people to just. get the book. <laughs> yeah, we want people to... Yeah, exactly. But, but I love answering it, and I usually overshare right. a bit. So go ahead. Uh, so, okay, I, I just want to make a disclaimer. Like, I was super invested in the lore in these games, um, especially Eternal Onwards. Some of the biggest questions I had when uh, Tag 1 and then Tag 2 came out was mostly lore-related uh, at that point, because I thought what you guys have done here is really creative in a way. You know, the lore is definitely in your face, but it's uh, for people who just want to play the game, like, they could still just keep playing. Like, I, I saw a like a top 10 doom games list and they had eternal kind of low because like it keeps shoving lore in your face and i'm thinking does it <laughs> yeah no it doesn't usually you could tell based on those lists how successful people were in whatever game like if they dominated in a game they put it high up on the list you know like you know they died to the marauder or they got bored of the super shotgun then it's low on the list like it you know it, it's all just so subjective our time Okay, first question. This isn't on my list. Is it Davoth or Devoth? How do you say that? Devoth. Devoth, okay. Or Davoth. Somebody Davoth. somebody said it once as Davoth, and I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> uh, the big twist of the Dark Lord at the end of Tag 2. What What is the mark of the Slayer now? Because like, my, my working theory was like, uh, it, it's the mark of Davoth, and then when the Doom Slayer got his power from the Divinity Machine, like that symbol like became associated with him. Uh, how, how does that work? I can't say too much, and okay. that's not a cop-out, because it goes into what a prime evil is. Gotcha. And uh, in in the fiction, it says only a prime evil could kill a prime evil or something stronger. It, it's a little bit of that. I would say that what the story kind of shows is that there can be only one at one time. You know what I mean? Like there is only one Slayer, and and it's him. And he essentially wakes him up just to basically kill him because it's like there's only going to be one of me. That's it. I can't say too much. Okay. I think, it, I think it's something that we need to cover in the fiction when we do the Slayer Gate, the Slayer te- uh, Testament. But uh, and I look forward to it. We are. We are. Yes. We have some we have some interesting stuff coming. I will I just want to say on that. It is it is it is his mark. Like there there is one slayer okay. now. Well now it's definitely his mark. Yeah, because he's he's uh <laughs> okay. he killed he killed that dude. People say like is the Doom Slayer dead? It's like no. I, I thought he was dead for a moment. I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah, a lot but, of like, people thought that. Uh with Doom Guy removing his helmet. Was that planned from the beginning to have him remove his helmet in full view of the Dark yeah. Lord? Okay. We've been saving when he would do that for like a long time. We've gotcha. been teasing like seeing his face. Now what's hilarious is that in modern game development, people took off his helmet about, you know, within a yeah, week. I, I, of us I saw that game. super early on and then yeah, there's that, so, that moment like that, that one of the first pictures of it like the FOV is really high and it just oh makes the god. face look distorted and everyone was it's like so oh bad. my god he looks so bad and then like you know you see it now and it's like oh no that's a normal looking face <laughs> no totally I, and well he is kind of weird looking but the the uh <laughs> we were intending to save the reveal of his face for the DLCs, but right. like everybody saw what he looked like. Though to be fair, knowing what Doom Guy's face looked like ahead of time made the Davoth reveal at the end of Tag One a little more interesting because it's like, that's oh, true. that's Doom Guy with the the Sentinel Hammer in Tag Two. How did balancing that go? And like, was there any other attempts at some kind of new super weapon, or were you like immediately like Hammer is going to be in Tag Two? Uh, only that whatever we do, it was like make it fit into the kill equation in a meaningful way like okay. like try not to let it cannibalize
cannibalize anything else, and it does cannibalize the chainsaw a little bit, a but little bit. Um, try to make it a meaningful addition to the dance. Something that you would encourage the player to combine their tools to get better results. Yeah, because like freezing and burning them That's with it. the hammer. Yeah, it's super yeah. satisfying. It is really satisfying. So, and, and then honestly, like Tag 2 was set up to like, if you started using it, you would be re- rewarded. If Tag 2 was like six levels, probably by level four, we would have started really increasing the challenge to make using that like harder. Like, not harder, but like more demanding but by the time you master it the experience is over i've talked about this before like i'd rather in the master levels like rather than nerf it i'd rather try to make a master level that uh you know working with the team that try to that we would make a master level rises to meet the challenge uh, the power of the hammer rather than nerf the hammer so sure. hey that's um, a good way we'll, to go about it from my point of view yeah anyway. i figure like let's just see how many tyrants can you handle with this thing <laughs> did criticism of tag one's difficulty kind of make you go back to the drawing board when evaluating difficulty for tag two because i know a lot of people complained about it being really fucking hard oh um, yeah totally so it wasn't well it wasn't well paced that was really the takeaway. Sorry, yeah, I cut I, you off. No, no, you're fine. Because in Tag 2, you have, like, those Screecher demons. And, like, I see a lot of people going, like, oh, there's this new obstacle. But the way that I saw them is it's, like, they're an on-off switch for difficulty. Like, I'll activate them on purpose yeah. and buff everything because, yep. like, I want that challenge. Which is awesome. That's, like, me- that's like don't use the BFGs. Like, yeah, the BFGs yeah. are there to help you, but, like, come on. Don't, don't use them. So, um, yes, it did. Like, uh, Tag 1's feedback. Uh, here's a perfect example. We had a the Tag 1. Then we the Slayer Gate at ship was too ho- too easy. So then we updated it, and it was too hard, objectively so. And th- they, the, the Steam reviews got dropped by, like, eight points because of that one encounter. And and the lesson that Wait, of the I Holt? learned was yeah when the Holt got updated yeah Didn't know by about like that. eight or nine point dude it, it dropped it and every comment was the person like they'd call out the Holt like the Holt is bad the Holt is bad you know that that one encounter so yeah, the, with the spirit marauder yeah so we learned that like there is a limit because the way that that was designed was let's just make that no holds barred like really hard it's the DLC it's a Slayer Gate it's optional let's have fun right. you know and, and push it really far and we learned that there's a limit there is totally limit to like you know let the modders make content you know that's like nuts but like we have to be really hard but there is a line even though on a even on a dlc it's pretty high but it's still a line so we definitely wanted to make sure that there was nothing moving forward that we make uh at least in the dlcs that or that we thought was a step too far you know like make sure that because we paid for it i mean like the the audience is they spoke you know they voted they said no (laughs) like and then we thought that the pacing of dlc1 could be better like there was just a couple of moments dlc1 uh had a a handful like two or three moments and that was one of them slayer gate that was just objectively too hard hidden tentacles fog spirit and the invisible pinky spawn immediately it was just like dude give me a break like how am i supposed to do this yeah yeah like and then the way that people were solving it was with exploits so yeah like they'd meet hook jump off to the side yeah which is like that's not what we intended like that wasn't the point so um so we learned that like you can go too far with base content base content master level we don't care like that's you know that's all about insanity ankle weights are off fucking have at that's it. it it's just keep the insane stuff for master levels and make sure that you keep the base content hard but don't cross the line sure and then pacing like we saw a lot of people get tired fun amazing awesome great but like a little exhausting it wasn't that we wanted to make sure that the whole thing got easier it was just like make sure you have peaks and valleys you know that you you break it up a little bit and not have it just be like relentlessly hard every single second that was really it just try to improve the pacing and uh and then watch out for those hyper spikes you know like moments that are like just a step beyond so tag two basically strove to have better pacing and even in the escalation encounters be 10 but you know, scale one to ten. You can go to ten. Yeah. Don't go to thirteen. And save thirteen for the master levels. And and honestly, what we found was for the majority of the audience, tag two was the more fun experience to play through the first couple times. Like people would say yeah. that to me that like like tag one, if this makes sense, tag one is better, but the but tag two is more fun. Like if that makes any sense, sure. like from from a first time player like who's going through it the first time, they know the game, you know, but they're they're going through like they yeah, had like, more fun. Um, when I played tag two the first time, like it felt like I was at an event. Like I was. At at Avengers Endgame in the theater again. Yeah, yeah. That, that sort totally. of momentous and you're just, feeling. And there's challenging moments. I mean, there's moments where it gets hard, but yeah, you, sure. you know, if you know the game, like, you you can you can have fun. You could really dominate. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Tag 1 more often because the difficulty feels a bit more engaging on 
repeat playthroughs, but absolutely no, like tag two felt momentous <laughs> without. Yeah, Sandy. I think tag. I've said this and I mean it. Like I think tag two is more fun the first time you play it, but I think tag one holds up with subsequent playthroughs. If you have the subtitles on when you go to face the Dark Lord, uh, those robed seraph-looking characters are called the Ancient Gods. Um, yeah, that's is- not correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It's like the mysterious voice thing. There's just so much stuff going on. Yeah, I, when I saw that, I was like, uh, I, you know, the ancient gods is a reference to just like you're resurrecting ancient gods. Right. What is your role in all this and who are you and stuff like that. But like th- them being called the ancient gods, that they're, no, that, that's not who they're supposed okay. to be. I mean, it's just, there's just a million things happening during development and it's like, it's hard to no, keep yeah, up with I, all of it. I totally get it. Though that does <laughs> kind of nullify the, the, I had like this whole, like half paragraph, like, what does this mean? Uh, oh, yeah, well, if it's not supposed to be like that, then, uh oh. They are um, observing everything, though. Sure. They, they yeah. are there at the end. Yeah, like, yeah. They like get, they're, they're watching the, the sarcophagus. Yeah, totally. They're the observers, you know, like, um, and, and, and fictionally they're from the same race as Samuel. Uh, again, I love the lore that you guys have here. It's, it's really engaging. Dude, I can't tell you how we have black belt combat fans of the combat or like Mayo, Uber black belt fan of the combat, but doesn't care about the lore. Like, just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah." Like just cool. But we have, uh, black belt lore fans. I I get asked so many questions. It's, that's why we do it. If someone who's not into it, they're like, why do you, I don't want to read stuff in doom. I'm always just like, don't read it. Yeah. Just don't read it. (laughs) Things like nobody, nobody cares. Like you don't have to, it doesn't matter. I don't, there's no choice. There's no like alternate ending. If you read all the, the, you know, just, kill stuff and have fun would you say that the the team that's like balancing these arena encounters at this point do they have like the balancing down to a science where they're like they know how the pacing of this is going to work or is it still a lot of trial and error i think we have a good sense honestly of, okay. of uh how to balance it now but it is still trial and error you know experimentation gotta be can't be afraid to fail see where that takes us and try to dial it in um as best we can so with uh with tag two when you meet uh commander valen and he gives you the hammer he's speaking to you in like that sort of hologram that in the same way that you talked to king novik to in the base campaign uh is there any similarities there or is that just a coincidence uh it's just a coincidence i mean it's kind of like Damn. how they i i don't want to go into too much about king novik and all that stuff but uh because i think that's something we should save for the uh, lore pages. Yeah, so not too much to say on that. In your interview with uh, Tyler McVicker, you mentioned that um, Doom 3's interpretation of Hell helped inspire uh, your modern interpretation of Hell in these games. Uh, Is there any more connections to Doom 3 to satiate that feeling, or is it really just the aesthetic part of it? I think it's the aesthetic part. I think the story of Doom 3 kind of went in another direction. So, I mean, we still have references to it throughout the game, but um, mostly it's the visuals. Okay. If you just had to ask, like, point blank, like, is Doom 3 canon? The answer's probably no. All right. It's all kind of canon. That's what's funny. Okay. Like, we really do cherry pick our favorite parts. Like, is Rip and Tear canon? Is like, yeah. yeah. But he says it the cheesiest comic but we still it's still part of the world you know so like Betruger you know characters like that like they could be used we're not too literal about it but yeah I think you know kind of parts of the structure of Doom 3 they don't quite work we, and we weren't too worried about it alright well actually that's most of my questions I do have a couple of finishing thoughts so mostly uh, so I, I'm a graphic uh, designer like I work a, I got a fucking big ass Zintique back here um, nice but uh, I, I wanted to ask, like, from your work as a uh, a concept artist and now like creative director, moving up to game director, um, what what's what's any words of encouragement or advice uh, would you give to any aspiring artists out there? Um, bah, bah, bah. That's good. Just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say just keep hammering on your craft. That's it, and and good things will come. Like okay. you know, you get out of it what you put into it. There's no such thing as talent. It's just mileage. That's it. Anybody could do that's, anything that's they want. Yeah, that that is the best advice. Really, is you're a thousand. There's a saying like you're a, you're a thousand shitty paintings away from being a good painter. So hurry up and start making shitty paintings. So that's like, that's good. I like that. I would just apply that to anything you do. That's okay. it. Just like don't don't worry about success or failure. Just make stuff thoughtfully. Take your time. Do your best. Evaluate. Move on. You know, and, and do it again and see where it takes you. That's it. You know, like I think if you just keep hammering on your craft, you you, you know, you follow your passions because it's going to be a winding road. I, I wasn't sixteen saying I want to be a game director. You sure. know, I, um, it just sort of I didn't know what the hell. The path. I, yeah, it just led me down the path, and because you never know, you might find yourself in a situation where holy cow, I'm, I'm actually you know good at being an influencer, or I'm good at you know doing this or that. Like you don't know where it's gonna. T- me and Josh might just retire and be streamers. <laughs> I don't know. Like, hey, I mean, I'd uh, still watch it. That's it. So, like, you know, let's see where. It- 
Let's see where it Let's goes. See where it goes. The the uh, but that's it. I would just say uh, it's all about mileage and listen to where your passions are taking you and and kind of go with the flow. But just keep hammering on your craft. Okay. I mean that's fair. I mean all those days of working on videos and starting off getting no views led me here. So hey, that's that's it. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. And if you think about it, you won't do anything. I mean that's the problem. If you if you think about it too much and you're, well, I need to do this and then I do that. It's like why don't you just do what you love yeah. and see see what happens. That's, you know, like that's, that's good. It. Uh, all right, and then my last question here. It's more of a fun one. Uh, if you could adapt any piece of uh, Doom's mythology or characters' weapons into a piece of physical merchandise, uh, what would you pick? Uh, man, there's a lot. <laughs> I'm looking at my collectibles now. Oh, you got a whole wall uh, over there? I don't have that much. Okay. I've given up that obsession, and I think my wife is pretty pleased about it. <laughs> um, I can't bring myself to spend too much on that. Like it kind yeah, of. It, it's an me. expensive hobby. I, I get it. Yeah, and like there's something about like look at this Iron Man. It was seven hundred dollars. Like that that doesn't sit well with. And then there's like, <laughs> and then there's the problem of like moving. I well, don't, I don't want it. anything to break. A hundred. Well, and then when I did move to Texas, it all broke. So oh, like no. absolutely. Oh yeah, I've got a Lord of the Rings friggin' Urukai laying on the fucking shelf right now oh. because I I don't I can't find the stand. Damn. It's the most annoying thing. I don't know. I want it all. <laughs> I just want good statues. That's it. Like, and give them yeah. to me for free, that, please. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean that. Um, I, I missed out on that classic Doom guy statue. I'm, I'm still beating myself up over that. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, that, that I don't know where I'd put it, but I'm, I'm sad I missed out on it. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, well, and the, the toys. I wanted the toys to get made, and they oh, are yeah. getting made. So, like yeah, the, I saw um, that. yeah. So, so uh, I don't know. You know what? Here's a good answer. I want a real Crucible. A oh, real crucible, a, okay. Yes, someone go make a real crucible. Well, you know, like I, fans have made high grade crucibles and they're badass. We need sideshow collectibles to make a replica of the crucible, like full awesome. one to one size, one to one something awesome. All right, uh, well, that's that's everything on my list. So sweet. Hey, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to meet with me. I, really, it means a lot. I I love what you guys have done. Your work is inspiring, both you as a person and what you've done for uh, Doom Eternal, Doom as a franchise as a whole. And and, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you from everyone at it for all your support. We really appreciate it. Of course. And, and, I, and I look uh, forward to seeing whatever you guys got in store for the future. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I, I hope that uh, we can meet again someday. Maybe, hopefully, at a convention or something. I can shake your hand. Quake on. Quake on. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, cool. I'm going to kill my recording now. <laughs> <laughs>